Um, my early years pretty much started in uh, eastern Kentucky in uh, Flatwoods, um, which was just a simple, simple life, just playing in the woods. Um, my dad worked on the railroad. My mom was a nurse. Um, I've got two older sisters. Uh, of course, it was a common harassment of one another, you know, the normal childhood grow up. Um, and pretty much stayed there for about 10 years uh, till I was 10 and um, then moved to northern Kentucky where uh, my dad had uh, broke his back on the railroad and they pretty much said, you're done here. So uh, he went back to school, went to uh, Ashland Community College, then uh, finished uh, his associates there, decided to go to uh, Northern Kentucky University. And uh, that's where he further pursued a degree in sociology. Um, so that, that kind of changed my whole momentum of where I thought I was going to go. Um, my grandfather worked on the railroad. My dad worked on the railroad. That was kind of a, an idea perspective of uh, that town is just kind of go work on the railroad. So, um, so that's kind of what I was expecting. Of course, my dad went back to college and kind of changed ideas for me at that point. Um, my dad always, once I grew up a little more, he kind of started discouraging the whole idea, thankful that we even got out of town. Um, by the end of my eighth grade year of uh, middle school, um, my mom got transferred by the Gap and um, moved to uh, Gallatin, Tennessee, which is uh, maybe 45 minutes north of Nashville. And uh, she became the occupational health nurse. Um, I wasn't too crazy about the idea. Um, I kind of got settled in northern Kentucky, uh, made a lot of friends, um, enjoyed my time there, but at the same time, it was just one of those moves that was more beneficial for my parents than anything. Honestly, that's when uh, I moved to Gallatin. Um, that, that's pretty much by the time my freshman year got going, um, I'd say it was probably in the right after Christmas time. I started, recruiters would come to the school and try and recruit whatnot. And um, at, at that point in my freshman year of high school, I always knew I'd join the military. Um, I've got a grandfather that served in World War II. Um, I have a bunch of um, uncles, cousins that served. Um, but at the same time, uh, my grandfather that I was closest to, um, he served four years in the Navy and then did another 26 with the National Guard in Kentucky. Um, and of course, I always looked up to him. He was pretty much a, an idol to me, um, and which pretty much drove my motivation into the military. Um, of course, it wasn't until the end of my, I guess it was the end of my junior year is when it came down to, all right, which direction will I go, which branch? Someone said I could be on the ground, you know, shooting all these amazing tools and guns, weapons, and um, that's when I decided the Army National Guard was for me. Uh, there was a buddy of mine, um, his name's Tyler Overstreet. Me and him uh, sat together our senior year of high school and um, discussed about going active duty together um, Army-wise, um, his, I believe it was his grandfather that was uh, in the Marines, and he was kind of weighing heavier on that, and um, then it came down to the fact that he failed, uh, it was his junior year that he failed, and uh, I pretty much was already a step ahead of him, and he he stayed back a year, and I just went on without him and just did the Army National Guard. Um, so, of course, later on, he went into the Marines, which, whatever floats his boat, you know. You still keep in touch with him? Um, that's the thing. Uh, Tyler passed away, uh, in Iraq in 2006. Uh, I want to say it was October 2006 from a, uh, improvised explosive device. So, that's, um...
kind of tough. Uh, I had just gotten home from my first deployment right after that had happened. So um, he was a uh, he was a great person, amazing, uh, dedicated to his service. Um, what makes it so hard to uh, realize is the fact that um, he was in country probably. I don't know, two or three weeks, found out that he had a son that was born, and uh, I guess it was maybe a few more weeks, maybe a month or two later, he was killed by an IED, improvised explosive device. So I finally signed with the Tennessee Army National Guard, and uh, about a week and a half after graduating from high school, went off to basic uh, June of 2003, graduated in uh, October of 2003 um, with uh, MOS as a uh, 19 Delta Cav Scout. My parents have always been supportive. You know, they always told me that uh, no matter what direction you take, just make sure it's the one you want. Um, you know, don't let anybody influence your decision. You know, just make sure you lay everything out on the table and know that that's what you want. And, um, I mean, they wasn't crazy about the whole idea, especially in, uh, the war had already kicked off in uh, March of 2003 in Iraq. And, uh, you know, wasn't crazy about the whole thing. But at the same time, they supported my decision. So... But uh, basic itself, uh, going through, I remember uh, the midway point, I completed my first nine weeks of uh, basic, and um, they had the split training guys that were still in high school. They were between their junior and senior year of high school, and they only came to do their basic, and they were leaving. And I remember seeing all the families there, and that was just heartbreaking. It's like, I, I need to be that guy. I, I need my family here. I'm ready to go. And... Uh, of course, my day came. It, it eventually came. Things got better. Um, there was, I don't want to say the, the drill sergeants took it easier, but it, it just became a lot funner. You, you learned the job that you were going to do in the Army. Um, you focused more on your job-specific training. And, I mean, at that point, it's here comes the gun shooting, driving tanks, things like that. And, um of course, being 18 years old, you know, playing with all these amazing toys was just the benefit of it all. I remember uh, we were out uh, doing our lane training, and um, <laughs> it was my turn to uh, drive the Bradley, uh, the tank, uh, back in from the field training we were doing. And, uh, of course, I, I climb up the side, and I set my my uh, M16 down on the side and I get in, I, I close the hatch down and I, I get the engine started and uh, get everybody in and the drill instructor, he's, he makes a comment, he's like, all right, everybody's in, let's go. We take off and I mean, I'm, I'm dipping in the mud pits, just splashing around, having a blast course. It's probably like three in the morning and um, we finally get to uh, the staging area with all the other Bradleys and tanks, and uh, I park, and he's like, all right, I need a sensitive items check. Well, I start looking around, and I'm sitting here trying to figure out where I would put my M16, and uh, it finally dawned on me that I'd left it sitting out on the railing of the, the Bradley, and my brain just starts freaking out. I'm, I, I know I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And uh, I finally open the hatch up and look out there, and there it sits. And uh, what had happened, like there's uh, paneling that goes on the side, which they call it a skirt, which just kind of covers the tracks. And um, luckily, they had them folded up to where it wedged itself down in there and locked itself in. And um, uh, if it hadn't have fallen in there, it had probably been the, the worst day of my life. I'm, I'm pretty sure. So, I was a, uh, my MOS is 19 Delta Cavalry Scout. Um, and also why you chose that. Yeah. Um, the reason I chose it is 
pretty much just because the unit was close to my parents' house, five minutes down the road. Um, and another reason was just because it was a hua hua job, you know, something that would get me on the battlefield. I could um, go into combat, have contact, um, and it was pretty much just, it, it was a combat MOS, combat job. And um, so that was pretty much the main reason. Um, the job uh, itself, being a Cav Scout, um, the way the whole training went is either be a Bradley driver or sit in the back and um, be a uh, dismount, which there's two scouts in the back of the Bradley and um, if ever needed, they would dismount go into uh, forward positions, observe the enemy, um, uh, conduct uh, in intelligence if need be, uh, find out what the enemy's doing, their positioning, what kind of equipment they would have, come back with that information. That way uh, my captain or platoon sergeant, whoever, would delegate the information, however, and um, I mean, I, I love the MOS. It's it's always been good just for the the action of it and always the consistency so um, always let me play outside so my unit was uh, detachment one uh, third squadron 278 um, army uh, armored cavalry regiment um, we were located in Gallatin Tennessee It wasn't till uh, March 1st of 2004, probably about four months later, got a phone call saying that the unit had been activated for a deployment, um, which was interesting enough. Um, that day, um, my parents, a buddy of mine I, I grew up with in Northern Kentucky, he played college basketball and um, he got me free tickets to a local college game that he was playing in in Tennessee. And uh, I went to watch him, and that's, that's where I was at, was at this ball game watching it and got the word right at the end of the game and um, looked at my parents and said, I'm, I'm deploying. I think once I, I crossed international waters, we landed in uh, Ireland, and I, I think things really started kicking in gear for me of, you know, this, this is really happening. I'm, I'm really going. Um, but once we uh, landed in Kuwait, I think that's when it all just blew up into proportion. Um, we got on the bus in Kuwait. Um, they gave um, probably like four people magazines to load in to uh, their weapons, um, providing security from uh, the Kuwait airport to uh, the base we were staying at. And um, I mean, it had really threw it into high gear at that point. You know, um, you always use dummy rounds during training. Um, whenever you would go do uh, certain uh, training scenarios, you always had blanks and now it's, here's the real live bullets, you know, it's, it, it's, it's go time, you know, you need to pick up the pace now. And, um, you know, that was, uh, that was really the biggest eye opener. So I was probably there three days and it, it took me all three days just to get over the jet lag. Um, I mean, it was so bad. I, I remember, uh, Thanksgiving day, um, I ended up, they gave us these cheap little plastic wine glasses with grape juice to celebrate Thanksgiving Day, and uh, I'm, I'm halfway out of it, and uh, I go to set my tray down on a table. My, uh, my glass falls on a Command Sergeant Major, and what, what made it even worse is that he was talking to a two-star general at the time that was standing up to him and uh, talking to him and of course my brain like I, I my whole group of guys were standing down here my squad leader included sitting there laughing at me my brain's not 
realizing the biggest mistake I had just made by a, spilling a glass on a command sergeant major and in front of a two-star general. And I, my brain's just like, I, I apologize, you know, I tried to find napkins and I, then I got another glass and almost spilled it again. So it was, it was just a horrible day. I, I try and wipe that uh, Thanksgiving away. Um, but yeah, we were there. Um, my unit was there pretty much two weeks, and um, uh, me and uh, one other guy were uh, selected to um, be the only ones out of our unit to actually drive into country uh, with headquarters and other units. And um, my squad leader, I have huge respect for, um, he, uh, he went to the commander and said, this is my guy, if he's going on this trip, I'm going with him. And I mean, he, he commander told him, he's like, find a Humvee, you know, uh, you're gonna have to, you know, do all the up armor to it. Um, th this is all on you. So he's like, Psh, don't worry about that. I, I got this covered. And um, of course, that, that was the greatest thing, knowing that, you know, me being 20 years old at this point, you know, th this is, real life's really kicking into effect and you know he's I mean he stepped up and looked out for me you know wasn't gonna let me walk into this blindsided and um, he made sure his Humvee was right in front of my truck and um, it was uh, I always uh, respected him for that along the trip we uh, came to this uh, one overpass and just as um, we got uh, past it, the, the whole convoy, which was made up of, jeez, uh, I want to say maybe 50 to 70-something vehicles. Um, and uh, I, I'd say I was probably right near smack dab in the middle of this whole thing. And um, we come up on this... Uh, father and his son and um, this lady and um, they're herding their sheep goat whatever you want to call them and uh, uh, the sheep kind of get their self out onto the road and this little boy runs out there to kind of wave him back off the road and his father comes up with his shepherd stick whatever and raises it just like this and I remember uh, pointing my weapon at him and just kind of letting him know that that's not a smart move at this point in time. And I looked back at the rest of the convoy and everybody that was probably supposed to be looking to the right, probably the next 15 vehicles were all pointed on him. And, uh, you know, I, I love kids to death, and I, I just couldn't fathom that idea that a father would raise his hand to his son for, you know, trying to help him out. Of course, there was no traffic coming, nothing like that, and, um, you know, one of those little speck of memories that, you know, it was no room for any BS to happen, you know. It's like everybody was sold into the whole idea of going in and uh, trying to help the better of the country and you know that seemed like it was the first step for all of us on that trip. We make the trip in uh, middle of the night and uh, wake up uh, the next morning. Um, I found out that uh, one of my cousins had uh, committed suicide and um, which kind of pulled me back. I mean we weren't close but at the same time, it was family. Mm -hmm. And um, it really wasn't the way I, I'd hoped to start this whole journey once I got into country. I, I didn't want the chapter to open like that, but that's the way the, the book's telling the story for me. And um, I remember having to carry that because um, not that night, but the next night I went on my first mission. It was in the middle of the night I'd never seen the city. So me walking into this with uh, night vision goggles, which is covering one eye, 
whole new high speed night vision and um, I'm, I'm still I learned how to use them but when you really put it into an urban environment where there's lights and then you have to use the moonlight at certain times and it was it was just a bad night to learn how to use the stupid things in a new urban environment and um, I remember uh, just one side of the city, I remember looking up, and all of a sudden, you just see rounds just flying straight in the air, and I was like, oh, here we go. You know, here's, here's my first piece of action. Let's do this. You know, I'm excited, and we get over there, and it's a wedding, and uh, so they're, they're doing this celebratory fire, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we go over to them and say, you know, you don't, don't shoot in the air. You know, what goes up must come down, and... Uh, of course, once we uh, leave them, uh, wouldn't you know, they go right back to firing rounds in the air again. And uh, that was uh, my first night of experiencing uh, that adrenaline build up. It's like, it, it's hard to explain, almost like uh, skydiving or um, going on a roller coaster that, you know, has no weight but just forcing you down. You know, it's. So, um, that pretty much kicked it off for me. There was, you know, I, I say this lightly, um, there was a group that uh, kept lobbing mortars towards our base, and um, there was times where you would hear, uh, it, it sounded like a can, like whooping end over end, it's like woof, 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 and you'd hear it and just kind of look up, see where it's going and uh, you know if it sounded like it was going to just fall on you you know you you take off if not it's like well hope it doesn't land inside the base and you just keep going about your business until something sparks to say hey you know this just happened blah 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 but until then you just walk about your business I remember one night being in uh, flip-flops walking across gravel with my towel and um, going to the showers and I, there it goes just stirring up and uh here i stand just watching it and i saw the the dust cloud off in the distance that night and uh it's like well at least it didn't land over here and it just go right on in my chew and <laughs> not yeah like like it was nothing and um you know at a certain point in time you, you almost have to sell yourself as you know you know if it happens it happens you know, I, I don't want it to happen. I want to go home, but at the same time, if it does, I guess God said it was my time. You need to desensitize the whole, uh, whole thing. Yeah. Uh, did you ever experience uh, direct contact on that first deployment? Um, there was one night. It was, um, th there was other occasions that it happened. Um, there was one we were at the, uh, Sadia City Council building, and um, I was on top of uh, the City Council building, and our uh, uh, colonel was there to meet with local officials. They're trying to um, like build a hospital for the community, um, work on roads, um, build uh, wells, dig them up, uh, provide more uh, natural water uh, within the city, and um, I'm standing on top of this building. Everybody else is out in this courtyard, which is uh, blocked off by a wall that you know no one could see in. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I'm just overwatching everything, me and a couple others. And all of a sudden, you just hear this, and it you hear this explosion off in the distance. And I look behind me, and uh, out in this palm grove, uh, someone had tried to fire an RPG at us. And uh, luckily, the palm grove, I guess, was just thick enough that, you know, there, there was no way for this rocket to get out. And, um, of course, you think about it, and it's like, well, thankfully it stopped there. But at the same time, it's like, there's probably 100 people down there, you know, me on top of this roof. There's three or four or five others up here, you know. It's, it it, it could have been horrible. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, that's one of those things you just kind of desensitize the whole thing and become cold-hearted to the whole idea that, you know, if it happens, it happens, whatever.
we come up on the situation where um, there's a couple of cars on the this little hill just up uh, next to the road, and then there was cars actually down beside the road. And uh, my LT makes the decision: we're going to stop, figure out what's going on. You know, if it's nothing, we'll just move on. We'll push out. And um, so um, he finds out that a uh, colonel for the local uh, Iraqi police had um, been uh, cold cocked in the back of the head with his own weapon. Someone had stolen his uh, uh, sidearm, his pistol, whatever, and then uh, there was other local uh, people with him. And uh, we're, we're trying to make sense. We set up security on the road and then uh, some up on top of this little hilltop with these other vehicles. And uh, they're trying to make sense, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, you just start hearing rounds whiz by. I mean, it's overhead. And I remember at one point looking up, and you could just see the tracer rounds on these bullets that are just flying over. And I'm, here I, I stand, you know, looking at it. And I, to this day, I think if I'd have probably raised my hand all the way up, I'd have probably touched it. What were you and, thinking was going on? Uh, at, at, the, at the first moment, you know, I was still caught off guard because everybody was, you know, it, it was, it stunned you because you weren't expecting this. And um, I remember one words coming out, someone yelling, uh, it's an ambush. Um, of course, we had full 360 on top of the hill and down on the road. Um, and, of course, we're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you can't see where it's coming from. We couldn't see a muzzle flash. Um, and finally, it was probably like one minute of rounds just kind of going over, but it was so fast. I mean, you wouldn't think that it was a minute. And um, after it all, during the whole situation, uh, I remember getting cover, and it wasn't, you know, where's everybody at? You know, what do I need to do next? The first thing that popped in my mind is, you know, who who's going to explain this to my mom? You know, if, if I don't walk out of this, who's going to explain this to her? Because, you know, I I wish you the best of luck. You know, it's like, you know, God, you're going to have to be with my mother on this one because, you know, if I don't walk out of this, Katie bar the front doors of the White House because here comes my mother, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of – it. I think that was really an instance that just set everything to a tone and a pace that, you know, as, as soon as, you know, I heard McKenzie, it was like everything from then on was just muscle memory. All right, providing security, um, making sure everybody was uh, within eyesight, everybody was good. Um, and uh, I remember our XO, he called up air support, I mean, Apaches just ruling the air. They, air Force came in above them trying to scan the area. And uh, come to find out, um, probably, I, I don't know how far away, but uh, there was local IP set up on this little hilltop. Huh? IPs? Yeah, Iraq, no, not IPs. I apologize. It was Iraqi Army that was sitting on this little hilltop. And uh, come to find out, they come down to us afterwards because our headlights are on you know i mean we were plain as day and i they figured that's pretty much what set us out that we had our headlights on and um <laughs> come to find out here comes this yahoo of a colonel i guess or captain for the iraqi army and uh come to find out it was the iraqi army shooting at us and uh you know my platoon sergeant was about to just thump him over the head i mean you know when you shoot at somebody it's it's not very well greeted you know and um he uh finds out that the only reason they shot is because uh you know they, they thought we were bad guys and it's like uh, no, other no no rhyme or reason no rhyme or reason and they just did it to do it and of course at this time um in early 2005, uh, maybe midway through, they were just starting training for the Iraqi Army and the police. And um, so, you know, they really hadn't had any training. You know, I'm, I'm almost contemplating why in the hell are you even out here, you know, if you have no training. But, uh, 
you know, they, they had no structure. So uh, they shot at what they thought could be entertaining, I guess. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, that was, that was an interesting night. And I remember um, we uh, collapsed our 360 and went on back to the base. We were probably like 30 minutes away. And uh, I remember walking in my uh, chew, which is our little hut of a house, and um, I looked at my roommate, and I was like, man, we, we just got shot at. He's like, all right, everybody all right? Yeah. Like, all right, well, I got to go on uh, tower guard here in an hour, so I'm going to go back to sleep now. And that was it. I mean, no one else talked about it. It was neither here nor there. Everybody went about their business. And, um, you know, at that time, it, you just don't talk about it. It's like it was what it was, and we'll go on. So. Thankfully, the first elections went off as smooth as possible. Um, I remember that day uh, uh, we actually uh, caught three uh, young men that uh, they were making a bomb. I mean, a handmade bomb. I mean, it was like a, you would almost think of uh, cartoons like a little round ball with a wick that was probably that long. And um, we bust them. Uh, my unit, well, the dismount group I was with, um, we were in an overwatch position, and uh, we were hidden kind of behind this berm, and the Bradleys were overlooking, and it was a Bradley um, gunner that was able to identify that these guys were doing something suspicious on the back of these, uh, this little uh, village. And um, so send out the dismounts, and I'm kind of trailing as a rear dismount, and um, they get so far ahead that I was like, well, I'll just kind of, me and one other guy, we flanked in behind and kind of wedged them in because when they saw us, they tried to disperse out into the village, and uh, the rest of my guys had already finally made it around to, we cornered them in and um, got the bomb and everything, and um, we were QRF that day, quick reaction force, and of course, you know, as soon as we call up that we caught someone with a bomb, you know, here comes the colonel, here comes Sergeant Major, you know, we, we got to be in this. And uh, um, it seemed like a whole herd of people came for this little bomb. And uh, I remember finding out that uh, later on, a couple weeks later, that uh, they let all three of them go because they said they were going fishing with it. I mean, it's like I, I've never heard of people going fishing with a bomb, but, you know, I, I guess there's a first time for everything. We get a call across the radio saying that uh, there's an Iraqi police uh, fighting a guy that is drunk in Sadia, and we're we're probably five miles up the road. It's like, here we go. We we're gonna see some uh, cops. You know, maybe we should film this. No one filmed it, unfortunately. But uh, we get off down there, and um, we get there, and come to find out, it was actually an IP. Iraqi police officer that was drunk, and he was looking for some guy to kill him uh, because of some disturbance they had had amongst each other, and um, so he's walking around with this AK-47, just kind of wallering around, um, and I remember the local IPs uh, that were there that had called us. We were just there to overwatch. We weren't there to partake in it. Nothing. This this is their this is their uh, part to step in and kind of start taking that leadership role of um, providing security within the community. And um, of course, all of a sudden, it was like six of them go running up to him, and they just start swinging. No one tried to knock him to the ground. Uh, no one tried to take his weapon from him. Um, and finally, I, you know, I, I don't know what it was. Something in my brain said, you know, enough's enough. And I go running up, and uh, I was a saw gunner, a 249 gunner. And, of course, my weapon's probably like that long. It's got a huge drum on the bottom of it with 200 rounds. And I, I hit, like, three of them. And one of them, just before I got to him, had knocked his weapon out of his hand. And... Uh, I grabbed this guy and we kind of spin like two or three times and uh, flop right into the side of the road. And uh, I'm on top of him. He's laying on his stomach. And uh, 
then uh, our interpreter came and jumped in with me and helped pin him down. And someone keeps yelling, you know, he's got a pistol, he's got a pistol, and his hands are tucked under him the whole time. And, um, I mean, I'm sitting there trying to do certain pressure points, trying to get him to relax his arms, um, trying to get up and under his shoulder blades, you know, something that will just make his muscles tense up to just draw his hands out somewhat where we can control him better. And, uh, you know, I mean, the interpreter finally told him, it's like, you know, I'll release your hands or, you know, more is to come, you know, and uh, finally uh, he, he was just gone. I, God never listened. We finally got his hands and uh, detained him. And, um, I mean, there was, there was, come to find out, there was no real strong rhyme or reason why he wanted to kill the guy other than the fact that he just li disliked him. And it's like, well, you probably fit in America somewhere, you know. We, we got a plenty of them people. And uh, I remember the rest of that night, I was just, I was pissed that, you know, um, after all this training we had given the IPs um, at this point, I mean, they had maybe several months of training. Um, and all they could do is just run up and they just started swinging. I remember seeing some of them kicking. And it's like, you know, I, I remember being there during some of the training, guys. You know, knock them down, put them on the ground, detain him, and no, couldn't do it. And uh, what made matters worse is uh, the sewage that runs along the road. You know, we, we call it Shit Creek, you know, and, um, <laughs> you know, it's all the sewage coming out of the houses, whatnot, and, of course, I'm, like, knee-deep in it on both legs and just the stank just made my attitude even worse to the whole idea. And um, I, I remember that night being uh, pretty specific, just uh, how things were going. It seemed like you would make progress, and then there was always a scenario that would just change your whole perspective of how things were going. I know it was probably uh, two, three months later that um, a... Uh, vehicle-borne uh, improvised explosive uh, vehicle, uh, pretty much car bomb, um, came down the road and uh, hit another car and um, killed uh, these two little girls and his father in another car. And, you know, kind of by the intel reports that it, it wasn't intended to hit this guy and the little girls, but that's pretty much the way it boiled down to. And, I mean, you know, we uh, showed up and, you know, you see limbs here and there and uh, it kind of draws you back for a second and, you know, you're standing there and at, at that point everything just, you become cold hearted. It's like, well, it wasn't me, you know, I'm here, you know, so be it, you know, let's clean this up. I'm ready to go back to my chew, watch a movie, eat a falafel, you know, and uh, call it a day. And, um, you know, that's, that was the hardest thing uh, is even coming out of that because uh, even when I got home from that first deployment, I mean, you know, someone died, you know, uh, someone was murdered, someone was raped, and, you know, I was still in that mindset of wasn't me, you know. So by December of 2009, I was out the door on my second deployment getting ready for Iraq. Um, I went, uh, advanced party, uh, in country, uh, got to Kuwait setting up, um, uh, different things for when the units came in this time, um, played a lot more of a leadership role the second round than I did the first time. And, um, which was all right with me, made my job a lot easier as opposed to the first time stuck cleaning up everybody's mess. This time I kind of got to delegate that whole issue. You know, there was one event, um, I remember we uh, were doing a supply route towards Missoula, and um, we we were the first unit to come through that route, and uh, all our missions um, at that time were being conducted at night. And um, so we come through, we're the first ones through the route, we're pretty much clearing it as we go, 
and uh, we get there, and supposedly, uh, once we get to Missoula, we're, we're stirring up, getting ready to turn around and come back an hour later, and uh, an IED had gone off on the route that we had just come through, and um, somehow it had faulted and hit uh, a local civilian car. Uh, and, you know, to sit here and say, you know, that, that probably should have been my vehicle, you know, how did it miss me and instead hit them? And it kind of brought back that cold heart mentality. It's like, well, better you than me. Um, you know, I, I, I got a wife to get home to and my parents and my sisters. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of just brought all the old memories really back into gear uh, into uh, that whole mentality. So, honestly, I look back and think that I skimmed by. I was lucky. You know, how do you make it through two deployments and really never get shot at? Um, I mean, never was I in a vehicle that was hit by an indirect explosive device. Um, and it's it's almost hard to say that I compare with those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, how can I say that my service uh, was great when others, you know, paid that sacrifice and I got off on a whim? And, uh, but if I, when I truly think about it, you know, I'm, I'm proud that I can say I served. You know, I, I look at a lot of people that are my age and, you know, they went bar hopping, you know. They were able to catch the Super Bowl Sunday, you know, the big game. Um, they were able to watch March Madness, you know, at a bar with friends. Um, you know, I, I can remember Christmas, you know, not being able to be at home with my family. Um, you know, um, my first year of marriage was being deployed, being away from my wife, and, uh, you know, even though I missed out on those things, I'm, I'm thankful to be able to have served, be able to um, provide things for a country that, you know, was being turned upside down by someone that only looked out for himself, who um, destroyed the Kurdish people in the north that, you know, just wiped out a mass of people just because they didn't agree with his ideology. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say that I truly am proud of the service I provided um, and that I was able to walk away with somewhat of a story. But, you know, I, to compare myself with others, I, I'd say I'm just your average Joe that put on the helmet, picked up a weapon, and just provided security. So. Pretty much um, the biggest thing that changed is that I was, you know, before I joined the military and everything, I was very uh, big in participating in church activities. Um, you know, I'd go on church trips, this, that, the other. Um, I was very uh, big hearted in participating with youth group, things like that. And um, you know, I got home and I just, it wasn't like I was against church or anything. I just, it was hard to come out of that mode of being cold-hearted and then come to a, a warming environment. Um, I, I struggled with it for a, for a little while. Um, you know, it's kind of like I said, uh, you know, I'd hear things happen to people, you know, car accidents, people dying uh, in America, and neighbors, and it's like, glad it wasn't me. I'm, I'm worrying about myself, you know, deal with your own business, and, um, you know, my mom really brought it up to me, and, um, you know, it was, it, it, it took a lot of time. I mean, and I don't mean just a few weeks. I mean, it was several months to kind of come out of that atmosphere of, you know, going from every day, you know, 
your your neck's always stuck out on the line, and then to come home and then uh, you're almost expected to just be okay, you know, that no one's out to get you. And looking back at Iraq, I I think of a lot of the good that we did. Um, you know, we helped build the hospital. You know, we helped train Iraqi army, Iraqi police. Um, you know, we put in wells. We uh, helped build, um, restructure a mosque. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, humanitarian missions. I remember going out and, um, uh, you know, we gave bikes away. You know, uh, my mom uh, tried to lead a, a program called uh, Operation Hands and Feet, and she went out into the community in uh, Nashville and whatnot and had people donate shoes and um, sent them over for us to pass out to the community. And uh, kids' shoes, you know, teens, um, you know, you'd see Michael Jordan's shoes running around the neighborhood, which was kind of humorous. Um, you know, every now and then you'd say, there goes Mike. And uh, uh, so, you know, those little things that uh, we did kind of, you don't take light of it because without that, you would almost look at your deployment as a waste of time. It was pointless. Why Why'd you even bother? All you did was go over and sling bullets and didn't accomplish anything in which in light and turn of things I mean uh, you know the violence was brought down by uh, a huge percentage number um, you know by us conducting patrols on a persistent basis you know the, the violence was brought down and um, you know by our efforts you know I, I believe the community was brought to a better point my uh, first run through with college was uh, a little rough. Uh, I, I came home from my first deployment and I was, I had just turned, I had turned 21 in country. And uh, so I, I was ready to get it out of my system. It's like, all right, you know, it's my turn to be young. Um, luckily, I was able to go to the bars. Um, you know, I could come and go as I pleased. I didn't have the military saying, where are you going? What are you doing? And uh, so I, I kind of cut loose. I was stupid for a little while. And um, finally, uh, my last semester in college, I, you know, I was at a point where I was tired of, you know, all the bars and things like that and uh, really broke down, cranked in the school and, uh met my soon-to-be wife at the time and, um, you know, kind of took a break. Um, tried to come to Kentucky and continue education, which school was outrageous to um, be considered out of state. And so I waited. Uh, I was going to wait a year, and then uh, the deployment came up, and so I just waited. And now um, that I'm attending the University of Kentucky, uh, trying to work on my business management degree. Um, so, you know, this go around is a lot different from what it was the first time. You know, um, I have my wife on my heels, you know, telling me I got to get done. She's ready for a house. Um, and so, you know, now that I come home, I, I think about all the hard work I put into the deployments, training and everything. And, you know, a lot of it helps me be a better student when I'm in class. Um, it's helped me kind of learn to um, control myself, uh, pace myself, um, and just kind of take a step back and not be in a rush. Um, have uh, more patience, I guess, uh, to uh, really focus on what I need to and uh, get done with school so well, what brought you to the University of Kentucky ah uh, I have been raised on the blue and white my whole life 
you know, uh, I was born during uh, the 1984 uh, Kentucky versus uh, Auburn game, Rex Chapman versus uh, Charles Barkley, you know, uh, Kentucky won that game and I was born during it. So I, I like to think that I was the blessing that provided Kentucky with that win that day. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've always been raised uh, as a Kentucky fan, uh, wouldn't have it any other way. Lived in Tennessee, took a lot of harassment for it. Um, always told them they look like a bunch of criminals. And, uh, you know, when I came to Kentucky, um, it's, it pretty much was um, a glove that fit. You know, it, it was the right thing. Um, everything, um, when I went to another university, it was so much hassle. And when I tried to come to Kentucky, everything just kind of slid into place. I didn't struggle with things, um, maybe a, a bump or two, but nothing that, you know, would give me concern to say, you know, this, this isn't the right step. I remember one instance, um, I was pulled for uh, hurricane relief duty and uh, went to uh, LSU's campus. And uh, we were standing out front. Um, the federal government had seized the gymnasium as uh, a federal aid relief. And there was a girl that came by. And, um, you know, to this day, it, it sticks with me is, you know, how, how can you stand there with your weapons, uh, you know, and the, th the biggest thing is, it's like, you know, I, I don't stand here against you. I'm, I'm not against you. I'm, I'm trying to help the better of the people. I'm, I'm not providing any harm to no one, you know, um, and of course, we got there late uh, in the hurricane relief. We were replacing another unit, and uh, you know, I, I was just kind of thrown back by this. And uh, when I came to UK, um, you know, there was, it seemed like there was a few people out there that just kind of did the same thing. It's like, how, how could you uh, go and uh, kill all these uh, women and children in Iraq? You know, all you did was cause harm to them. You know, they'd have probably been better off without you. Um, and the hardest thing about that is, is trying to take that with a grain of salt. Um, my first instinct is to rear back and just give them a good one. Um, of course, you know, anywhere you go, um, you're always going to have someone that disagrees with your ideas, you know, whether it be... Um, which type milk is best or, you know, which road is best to take. And, uh, you know, I chose the military, you know. Um, it, it's made me a better man, a better soldier, a better husband, a, a better son. Um, and it's, it's almost appalling to think that someone would look at you as if you're a criminal. And... Uh, you know, I brought no harm to no one, you know. I, only time I can remember ever firing one shot is at a firing range while I was in country. Uh, and the problem is, is no one knows your story. No one knows where your road is taking you, you know. Who's to say that someone didn't hit someone on a crosswalk and just take off? How do, how do I know you weren't someone like that? And, um, you know, it's, it's hard not to, like, you want to argue with them and fight their ideas of who you are and uh, try and explain to them, you know, I, I've done good in the world, you know, I, I've been a corrections officer, um, you know, I've worked for um, uh, family readiness programs, I've uh, been a team leader for uh, military funeral honors, I've I've buried a best friend that, you know, gave the ultimate sacrifice that never saw his son. Um, and, you know, to be judged is the hardest thing out of all of it. Um, you know, 
it's it's almost hard to take at times. So you know, the first time I started using the GI Bill, it was pretty bland. Um, you know, I got money to pretty much live on, and um, I got tuition assistance also, and there wasn't much help from the first university I went to. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a constant battle of trying to get school paid for. I was taking out loans, uh, tuition assistance, was barely covering. Um, and it seemed like they came out with the new uh, post 9-11 GI Bill and everything was just a hundred times smoother. Um, once I transferred over from the normal Montgomery GI Bill to the post 9-11, uh, you know, everything was a lot easier. My housing was being paid for, my school was being paid for, my books were paying for. All I have to do is work a side job just to provide food and that's it. Um, you know, I, I didn't have to burden myself with having to work a lot harder of a job for more money and then try and compete with trying to complete school. This way I'm, I'm able to stay a lot more focused. You know, I believe that the University of Kentucky's picking up with that idea that, you know, um, troops are looking for a university that supports them and um, that the soldiers have something to offer, not just um, the school itself, but the student body as a whole. You know, we, we can help programs build. You know, we, we know how things should be structured. You know, that, that's what the military preaches. You know, there, there's a structure to everything how things should go in order. And, um, you know, I, I think between universities and the government, things are kind of building a lot stronger than what it was in the past. I remember the hardest question um, I was ever asked, and to this day it was still the hardest question I ever was asked. Um, it was before my first deployment, and my father came to me. My mom wasn't with him. And he asked me, he's like, you know, I want you to think about this. You know, I don't want an answer today. I don't want it tomorrow. He's like, sit on it for a little while and let me know. And his question was, is if something happens to you, where do you want to be buried? And I was 19 at the time. And, um, you know, I look back at that whole idea and spread it across everything I've done to this point from, you know, completing schools, trainings, deployments, and it, it, it takes me back to a sense of how is it that anybody could ever ask their child, you know, where do you want to be buried if something does happen? You know, I To this day, I, I, I ask me a million questions about math, which is my horrible subject, and I just kind of come up with a, a guess, you know. Uh, but that question to this day lingers as my hardest question. Um, 